Good evening. Welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study. Glad to have you with us. And we're going to be again in uh, Mark chapter 14. And we'll be looking at verses 37 through 42 this evening. Let's begin with a word of prayer, shall we? Lord, we come to you this evening and we just thank you for the privilege uh, that is ours to dig into your word. I pray that you would teach us through the Lord Jesus Christ, his example, and that of his disciples. Lord, teach us the truths that we need for our lives. We thank you for your eternal word that is valuable uh, in every generation. And I pray, Lord, that we would cherish it for the treasure that it is. And that as we look into it tonight, that we would allow your Holy Spirit uh, to speak to us in a personal way. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mark 14 and verse 37. <clears throat> now, if you recall, last week we looked at verses 32 through 36. And in those verses, we see Jesus and his disciples coming into Gethsemane. And uh, he takes apart his uh, uh, three, uh, three of the disciples, Peter, James, and John. And they go a little farther into Gethsemane, and he begins to pray. Uh, we looked at his prayer last week and what that was all about. Uh, if you missed that, I encourage you to go back and uh, watch that video from last Wednesday. But we find in verse 36, his prayer to the Father, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. And then we come to verse 37, and it says, And he cometh and findeth them sleeping, and saith unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldest thou not watch one hour? And so Christ, uh, as he was pouring out his heart in prayer to the Father, and we know we, we, we looked at the agony with which he prayed last week, um, he pauses, he stops, and he comes uh, to where he had left the three disciples, and he finds them sleeping. We mentioned last week that uh, the hour was late. Uh, they had come from the upper room in Jerusalem. They had left Jerusalem and uh, taken their journey down through the Kidron Valley across over to the Mount of Olives here to Gethsemane. And so it was a late hour and uh, they obviously uh, were tired. And so he finds them sleeping, and he, of course, had commanded them uh, to watch. We see that in verse 34. He said, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye, tarry ye here and watch. So he had commanded them to watch, and we saw last week that that word watch uh, has to do specifically with remaining alert, uh, not falling asleep. And so he had given them that command, and he comes now and finds them, having failed at that, he finds them sleeping. And he says to Peter, uh, specifically, Simon, uh, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldst not thou watch one hour? It was important for his disciples to grasped the significance of this hour. Up until this point, they didn't appear to comprehend the reality of what was coming in regard to Christ's betrayal, arrest, his trial, and his crucifixion. In his agony here in prayer in Gethsemane was the gateway to all of this and provided testimony of the significance of the current hour in which they find themselves. But Christ here finds them sleeping through his agony. So he rebukes Peter specifically, 
And he asked two questions. Sleepest thou? In other words, why are you sleeping? Why would you be sleeping when I gave you the command to watch, to stay alert? And then he asked the other question. Couldst, thou not, couldst not thou watch one hour? Could you not remain awake at least an hour? It was a question of rebuke question of condemnation, a question of disappointment, and one of which I'm sure Peter and James and John were greatly ashamed. We find in verse 40, they didn't know what to answer him. But after asking the questions, now in verse 38, he continues and he says, Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. And so his command changes from just watch to now watch and pray. As was the case throughout the ministry of Christ, he was teaching them spiritual truth. And the spiritual truth here in this verse um, is significant. He had been demonstrating in his prayer there in Gethsemane, by his own example, he had been demonstrating the spiritual battle between the flesh and the spirit. And now he was calling them to join that battle for their own spiritual well-being. I don't believe that Christ here uh, in calling them to watch and pray lest they enter into temptation was only speaking in terms of the temptation to sleep. I think there was more at stake here for them and I think that he was encouraging them in a greater way for their own spiritual well-being. Christ himself in prayer was aligning himself in human weakness with the will of the Father, right? He said, if it be possible let this cup uh, pass from me, nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. And so he here in, in, in prayer in Gethsemane was aligning himself, his own human weakness, with the will of the Father. And he was calling them to make the same commitment, to do the same. He was calling them to the same spiritual exercise. The disciples were headed toward spiritual temptation as well. Christ, of course, we know, was headed toward betrayal, arrest, trial, and crucifixion. And the disciples, we know, we know, were headed toward their own temptation. And so they needed divine power that, that, that Christ was showing them could be accessed through dependent prayer upon the Father. He had told them in verse 27, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. So he had predicted their failure, their spiritual failure, their failure to follow Christ, to endure the temptation, the testing. And so he was imploring them here to take advantage of this time, this hour, this moment to approach the Father in prayer for the spiritual strength that they would need for the moments to come. Temptation was inevitable, but to enter into the failure of temptation could be protected against by prayer. And that is the idea here of watch and pray lest ye enter into temptation. He was warning them for the next event, 
He was warning them and trying to prepare them for the next scenario. Their faith would be tested. Their allegiance to Christ would be proven. And he's imploring them here to pray so that they would avoid the failure of temptation. The readiness of the Spirit was there, right? Notice what he says in verse 38. The Spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is is weak. We know the spirit was ready, don't we? Peter had said earlier when Christ uh, when Christ said all shall be offended because of me this night. Peter says in verse 29, oh, the, although all shall be offended, I'm not part of the all, right? He says yet will not I. So the Spirit truly was ready, but the flesh was weak. That was the problem, the weakness of the flesh. And that's why Christ was challenging them here to watch and to pray. Because although the Spirit was willing, although there were good intentions, the flesh was weak. And this truth here is echoed by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 7, verses 18 through 20. He said, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will, or in other words, to want to do right, is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do, that I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. The key that Christ gives for this struggle between the spirit and the flesh is the tool of prayer. You see, sincerity and good intentions will not win the battle alone. Now, they may be the first step of preparedness for the battle. You can't win the battle if you don't want to win it, right? If the good intentions aren't there, if the sincerity isn't there, if the spirit is not ready, then forget winning the battle. But sincerity and good intentions will not win the battle alone. Instead, divine strength must be drawn upon for victory. And that's what Christ is doing here in his prayer in Gethsemane. And that's what he is encouraging his disciples to do here in Gethsemane as well. He is calling them to mimic, to imitate this drawing, of divine, uh, drawing upon divine strength for future victory. And Christ was teaching them that by aligning themselves with the will of the Father in prayerful dependence, the will of the Spirit could have victory over the will of the flesh. He, it says in verse 39, he went away again and prayed and spake the same words. And when he returned... He found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. Neither wist they what to answer him. And so he leaves them there after telling them not just to watch, but now to watch and pray. He leaves them there, and he goes back and he continues to pray. He repeats again this agonizing prayer to the Father. He returns, he finds them asleep again, and they don't know what to say to him. They don't have an answer. In other words, they're ashamed. They're ashamed that they had slept again. And we find uh, 
we find here now in verse 41 that he cometh the third time. So he had left again to pray again. And now in verse 41, he cometh the third time and saith unto them, Sleep on now, take your rest. It is enough. The hour is come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise up, let us go. Lo, he that betrayeth me is at hand. And so a third time now he finds them sleeping while he's praying. This time he relieves them of their responsibility to watch and pray because he announces that the hour of his suffering has arrived. He had made good with the Father in prayer. He had drawn upon that divine strength. And all was well between him and the Father in regard to his responsibility to fulfill the Father's will. And so the hour had come. That was obvious. That was apparent to Christ. And so upon returning a third time, he finds them sleeping again. And he tells them that no need, there's no need to watch any longer. The hour has come. Specifically, the hour in which the Son of Man would be betrayed into the hands of sinners. He tells them to rise up, to follow him. He that betrayeth me is at hand. We'll look at the betrayal of Christ um, in verses 40, uh, 43 and following. 43 to 52. We'll take a look at that next week. Um, I, I, I wanted to not uh, shortchange that. And so we'll, um, we'll pause here. And uh, pick it up again next week in verse 43. But we have to take seriously for ourselves the obligation that Christ placed upon his disciples. They were told to, to watch, to stay alert, and to pray, to take the time uh, to agonize in prayer with the Father independence upon him. His command to them to watch was in a physical sense. Uh, but perhaps a spiritual sense as well. For us, we must watch as well. Spiritually speaking, you and I have an obligation to stay alert we find in the epistles, um, Paul's epistles and Peter's epistles, encouragement after encouragement to be sober, to, to watch, to be spiritually alert. And you and I have that same obligation and command in a spiritual sense. We must be alert spiritually. We cannot afford to fall asleep at the wheel in a spiritual sense. And in our spiritual alertness, we must look to God in prayer. The temptation's coming, right? You and I live lives that are full of temptation, either temptation to sin or testings or provings. We see that in James chapter 1. We see that in, um, uh, in uh, 1 Peter. These temptations, these testings that come in our lives. And we will not endure, we will not have victory if we are not spiritually alert, if we are not watching spiritually, but also we will not have victory if we do not Fight those battles in prayer. We must watch and pray. 
What Christ was doing in Gethsemane was aligning himself with the Father's will, showing a complete submission to what the Father wanted to do, had planned to do, and also showing a complete dependence upon the Father to carry out his responsibility. And you, you and I must do the same. We must direct our spiritual alertness to God with dependent prayer. For it is our dependence upon him that strengthens us in times of spiritual testing and temptation. Perhaps you're spiritually weary. Perhaps you are heavy in this moment, in this time, spiritually speaking. Watch and pray. Draw upon the strength of the Father for endurance. Draw upon his grace that he extends infinitely to you and me for our spiritual health and well-being. Don't be Peter or James or John. Don't fall asleep before the moment of temptation. Watch and pray so that when that moment comes, you'll be prepared. You'll be ready and you can have victory in that temptation. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this reminder. And we thank you for the, the divine power upon which we can draw for our weak flesh. Lord, I believe that each one uh, watching tonight is indeed willing, truly willing. Lord, that spirit is ready. But for all of us, the flesh is weak. And so, Father, I pray that you would cause us to watch and to pray, to depend upon you, for that power, that assistance, that divine strength that we need to endure the temptation. We thank you for, for that in advance. We claim it by faith. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.